so I wanted to back up a little bit. We've gone back about five slides in the notes because we did this assumption here uh, that two minus x is equal to two. And we had some good questions about that, but there is a rule of thumb that you can use, and that is this. So that, that initial amount, that, that concentration of base, was given in the problem. And so we call that the nominal concentration. What do we mean by nominal? Nominal's name, right? We just named it. It's as if you had a bottle, and on the label it said two molar. Okay? The, the label isn't an equilibrium number. The label is just the label. And so it could be dramatically different. There could be a different species in the bottle. Like we have uh, on our concentrated ammonium hydroxide, or sometimes it just says aqueous ammonia. Okay, so which is it? Is it ammonia or ammonium hydroxide? Well, at equilibrium, you'll see that it's ammonium hydroxide, but the bottle may be labeled ammonia. And so that's the nominal concentration, or what we call C. Instead of using a bracket for that, you can just label it C base. So that would be the concentration of the base, 2 molar. And so you can use this nominal concentration. If that's greater than your... Uh, your uh, equilibrium constant by a factor of 100, then this assumption is good. So if you look at this, we made that assumption, and so this is a nice rule of thumb. You'll have less than 1% error if this works. Okay. So C base over KB, if that's greater than 100, then you're okay with that assumption. So that's a nice rule of thumb. And I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Uh, also, where is the C base in this table? It's that one up on the initial row, right, the 2 molar. So you're comparing the 2 molar concentration of base to Kb. Now, if this was an acid and you're doing acid equilibria, then it would be C acid over Ka. So same kind of thing. You just write the equation. You've got to know your Ka or your Kb, and you've got your nominal concentration, and you can compare those two. So in this example, the next example, we had to use the quadratic formula because our concentration was 0 0.0025. And so because the nominal concentration was so small, you take that and divide it by the, the, um, the Kb, 6 times 10 to the minus 5. We had essentially 3 times 10 to the minus 3. So you know, it wasn't quite 100. So we needed to then take that into account. That assumption wouldn't be good. And so we would then have to do the quadratic formula. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to emphasize that rule of thumb since it wasn't in there. So let's move on to our, um, our next example where we're talking about buffered pH in the digestive tract. <clears throat> and so this is sort of a... Uh, the road sign as we fly down this highway of forensic chemistry, this is the exit for pharmacology. <laughs> okay. So we went in here, then we would learn all about pharmaceuticals and where they go in the body. We'll come back to this a little bit when we get into toxicology, and we'll look at uh, roots of entry, and metabolism, and elimination, and different fluids in the body. Uh, but this is the beginnings of pharmacology. So how do pharmaceutical agents get into the body? Most of the time they're taken uh, orally, and, and so Bases and uh, acids are all protonated in the stomach, okay? But the bases are protonated and become uh, BH+, plus, base with a proton, positively charged, and so therefore they're ion ionized, and so then they go into the bloodstream. And then they might be deprotonated in the colon, the pH is 7 to 8, so it's very slightly basic in the colon. And so then... Uh, the acids are deprotonated in the colon, and they're more soluble. So if you have an acidic substance, it's not going to be absorbed in the body very much in the stomach at all. Uh, when it gets to the colon, then it'll be absorbed. So if you wanted a time release, something that uh, comes out slowly into the body, then you would want it to be acidic so that it doesn't go into the bloodstream until later in the digestive tract. But if you wanted an instant action, like a headache medicine that was for fast acting, then you'd want it to be a base so that it would go into the bloodstream as soon as possible. As soon as it hits that acidic uh, gastric region, it goes right into the bloodstream. And so you can tailor your formulary this way, and that's what pharmacology is. So let's look at the, the ice table related to these different environments. So here we have a uh, generic base. Well, we've got this uh, phenedimetrazine tartrate. So this is a, a basic substance. It has a pKa of 7.6. And so in the stomach, which has a pH of 1, we can put this in. Let's just say, a, you know, we've got a 1 molar 
concentration of this BH plus. Uh, I went ahead and wrote it out as BH plus plus water gives the hydronium ion so that we would have acid in our equation because we know the concentration of the acid. pH of 1, 10 to the minus pH is 0.1. So that's the concentration of the hydronium ion. And so just for, just to, starting with just one mole of base, I wanted to see what would happen to that number. And so we're looking at this. Uh, essentially, we have zero at the beginning, our initial amount zero for the uh, deprotonated base. So let's work our way through this. We have the change row. Always look for, for the uh, double arrow. I always write the re reaction above the table if I can so that the double arrow here tells me where the sign is changed. So the left side is the reactants, the right side is the products. It's just a nice little visual way to show where that, air, where that plus and minus changes products and, and reactants. And then we come down here, we have this assumption here. And so then, uh, is this going to be a, a good assumption where we could do that, that C uh, acid over the pKa? We have 7.6 is our pKa. So Ka is going to be uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 6. Let's see, but I thought I had it written out. Let's go here. So 10 to the minus 7.6 is our, is our Ka. So yeah, that's really small. And so we have 1 over that. That's greater than 100. So this is going to be uh, an OK assumption. But it's also going to be an OK assumption because over here, we have so much acid, it's going to keep the reaction from going to the right. Because we have so much acid in the products already, there's really no driving force for the reaction to go forward. So if the reaction goes forward, we're making the solution even more acidic. And we wouldn't want to do that. I mean, this is a weak, weak, weak acid. Our Ka is 10 to the minus 7.6. So it doesn't want to go forward really any at all. And now we have uh, 0.1 moles per liter of acid already in the stomach juices. And so it's not going to go forward much at all. So we could go ahead and calculate what X is just for granted to see if there's a substantial amount. We know there's not going to be, but let's see what it is. And so we can rearrange this. We set up our Ka. We have 10 to the minus 6 equals X for the base, 0.1 for the acid, and 1 for the protonated base. Solving for x, we get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7. So that's going to be a very tiny amount. And since we have really not changed the initial amount, we have 100% protonated or 100% ionized base in this situation in the stomach. Let's pause here for any kind of comments or if you want clarification on anything. What's the major difference in this ice table than the previous two that we did last time? What's that? What's that? I didn't hear you. Oh, um, sorry. Yes, yeah, so we we already have a pH for the system. So in the last two, we were asked to to solve for the pH. In this case, we put it in a solution that has a buffered pH. It's, it's, the pH is fixed at 1. So that tells us what the acid concentration is. And it's going to be really difficult to change that. Okay, so that, that hydronium ion column is going to be 0.1 all the way down, even at equilibrium, because it's buffered. And so that really makes the math simple. You almost never have to do a quadratic formula for a buffered system because you're fixing the pH. Or you're fixing the hydroxide ion concentration. Let's look at the next one. Let's uh, go into the colon where the pH is 7.6. Now, if our Ka, pKa is 7.6 and the pH of the system is 7.6, you'll see this, but when the pH equals the pKa, what's magic about that spot in the pH curve? When the pH equals the pKa, Okay, I'm just checking to see if everybody knows it. Okay, you don't know it. That we'll, we'll see that that means it's 50% ionized. So when the pH equals the pKa, that's the situation where you have 50% ionization. That's where you're shifting from protonated to deprotonated. 
And that's an important principle. So go ahead and write that down, and then we'll do the math, and you'll see that it works out. So when the pH equals the pKa, you're 50% protonated. The reaction is right in the middle. You have equal reactants and products. So let's look at the math for this one. So uh, we start out with just some amount of uh, protonated base. Here's the X's. Now this is buffered, so it's unchanged. Um, the hydronium ion concentration, because we're at a pH of 7.6, is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8. And that stays the same. And so here we have 1 minus X and then X. And we can't make that assumption that that's uh, insignificant because our... Uh, our concentration and I mean because our system is buffered and we're going to have uh, quite a bit of X move over so let's go ahead and set up our our Ka equation using the uh, the acid concentration the base the deprotonated base and the protonated base now this 10 to the minus 7.6 is 2.5. So we have that on both sides of the equation, so we can cancel that right there. And so this becomes 1 on this side. We divide both sides by 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8, so we have 1 equals x over 1 minus x. So we can bring this over to this side, and we have 1 minus x equals x. And so then we'll bring the other x on the other side. So we have 1 equals 2x. And so that's how we got to this part. So 1 on the left, 2x on the right. And so then x is 0.5. And so if x is 0.5, then look what we have on our equilibrium row. We're 50% ionized. Because 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0.5, and then uh, 0 plus 0.5 is 0.5. So we've just shown with the ice table that when the pH equals the pKa, we're 50% ionized. Okay, shown it mathematically. We can see that also in a couple more slides when we talk about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So when the C base equals C acid, then you end up with pH equals pKa. And so we have, uh, you know, 50% of our ionized base is remaining. The other half has been deprotonated. And so we'll look to see uh, when we get to liquid-liquid extraction what's happening in this situation where you have half the acid is proton or half the base is protonated, uh, it will that half will go into solution into the bloodstream, but then the other half has to be has to come to equilibrium again and then it'll go into the bloodstream. So it's not that it never will be absorbed, but it'll be absorbed much slower. The the uh, base goes into the stomach right away. And so it's essentially gone. It doesn't make it to the colon. But if it did make it to the colon, it would be absorbed slowly. Any points of clarification on this one? Okay. So let's talk about, yes? Is that like a more general question? Because like at HEB, they have this like alkaline water or whatever. Yeah. It's like pH 9 or 11 or something. So like if someone drinks a lot of that, like, would that just make it impossible for their colon to absorb anything? Or like it won't. It won't make it past the stomach without being modified. Yeah. So it's essentially. I mean, it might be good if you have uh, acid reflux or you know sour stomach. It's essentially like you're taking a um, an acid pills. It's like if you chew on Tums or Rolaids or if you take milk of magnesia, those that have a high pH. And so if you have uh, gallbladder issues and really bad stomach acid, you know, drinking that alkaline water would be just like chewing on a Tums. Yeah. But they make all these wild claims, and their claims, as far as I can tell, are bunk. I mean, some of the stuff that they say. Uh, your stomach immediately buffers anything that you eat. Yeah. So if you, if you drink that water, it's just going to, you know, let's say your stomach was acting normally, and you had a regular amount of stomach acid and the lining was good and everything was was happy or healthy individual and you drink alkaline water it's just going to make your acid pumps pump out more acid to adjust the balance again so, so i'm not so sure i mean again your body can respond to um environmental insults you know and drinking non-neutral water is going to be somewhat of a small insult 
But if that was everything, you always drank that. I mean, it seems like eventually your body would adjust, and then your acid, you you probably give yourself acid reflux. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not so that. sure that that's. I mean, again, I'm not a doctor, but um, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express. No. <laughs> 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 but but uh, you know, you, you, your your life is a balance, right? And to constantly stand on one end of the balance beam and and make your body balance you out. Uh, what if it's what if it can't keep up? You know, I just don't think it's it's a great idea to to jack with water what you're drinking. But I was just curious if like you could give yourself an issue because like there's yeah. no warning label or anything. Like yeah, that. no, because your body can handle it in small doses, and so that's the number one thing for toxicology is that the toxin is the dose, and so we typically screw ourselves up because if a little's good, a lot is better, and that's not true. You know, and so maybe if you got a rumbly tummy and you drink some of this alkaline water, it makes you feel better. It, it neutralized some of the excess acid that you were making. And you're like, oh, that's great. I'm going to drink it every day now, all the time. And that's not a good answer. You know, that's why I'm a little wary of supplements, you know, because you're going from nothing to taking something daily. And why? Why would you just jump your, no, I take a multivitamin, okay, because most of those metals are soluble. And so if I take more than I need, I'll pee it out. So. But you can overdose. You can, you know, the toxin is the dose. If I took a whole bottle of those uh, pills, my body couldn't handle that jump in metals, and so it would totally screw up my biochemistry. And so that's not good. So anyway, um, that's why they you hear the phrases: all things in moderation. You know, don't don't knock your body off of the balance point. Is that's wise advice. We'll see that in the toxicology part. The people have died from drinking water. You drink too much, drink two gallons of water without peeing, you could dilute your bloodstream enough that your central nervous system starts to shut down. Yeah, it just can't get the signals through. It's called uh, um, essentially a, a low sodium. So let's look at this percent ionization. You know, that's the calculation. I said part over whole, so it's the ionized species over everything. And we can break that down. Let's, for, for reasons that we'll see later, we'll flip it upside down. And that way we can split that denominator into two. We can have HA over A minus and then A over A minus. And so that reduces to HA over A plus one. So we'll leave that there, or we can flip it over. We can have, uh, we can get all the ones and everything on one side and, and get the HA over A. So we'll leave that, we'll kind of put that in our pocket. We might need it later. Okay, then we'll go over to the Ka equation. Because we have A over HA on the right, we're going to use this in our equation over here. But let's just take this equation and take the minus log of both sides, because that'll give us pKa, and the minus log of hydronium ion will give us pH. So we can just take the minus log and we have this equation here. That the pKa is equal to the pH minus the log of that ratio and then if we, if we switch this, this log over to the other side, it becomes a plus. And so we have pH equals pKa plus the log of this ratio of base over acid. And that's the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So they got a whole equation named after them, after just two steps of algebra. <laughs> How can that be? Anyway, I guess it helps to be first. But, you know, isn't that awesome? You know, everybody knows this equation by their name, and it's just the equilibrium constant expression. And nobody knows who came up with that. I mean, we do, but they don't have a name associated with it. That's a more important equation at the top. That's like governing all equilibria, and they don't have a name with it. Poor sap, whoever published that paper. You know. <laughs> and so then let's play with this. We have an A minus over HA. We have that kind of thing over here. And so let's put in our... Uh, our equation. Now notice this is A on top and HA on bottom. And over here we have A on bottom and HA on top. And so we're just going to change that plus sign to a minus sign and then it makes it all good. <laughs> okay. You can prove that to yourself in your homework notes. Okay. And so then we have this equation. We have the pKa, pH. And so let's rearrange this. Let's get that KO over on the other side. And so we have pKa minus pH equals the positive log of this business in this inside. Uh, let's, let's get rid of all those logs. 
Okay, so let's raise everything ten to the to the both sides. We'll get rid of the log. And so I have the stuff in the middle, 10 to the difference of pKa minus pH. And now I can move that one over and I can invert the whole thing. So if I move that one over and I invert it, then I have percent ionization and all I need to know is the pH and the pKa. So this would be the pH of the stomach or the colon or the small intestine and that would be the pKa of the substance. Written as an acid equation and that would be the percent ionization of that acid. So this is the equation for buffered percent ionization. And I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like seven or eight lines of algebra, so I'm claiming this one. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I don't think that's going to catch on, but you help me out and tell, tell everybody that you know. Okay. So, um, so this was good, but this is only useful for for acids, notice I have HA becoming A minus. So the whole premise of this equation is the percent ionization for an acid. And since we're talking about ionization, we need to pay attention to whether we're looking at an acid or a base because they're ionized in different sides of the pH. So let's look at the curves here. So for an acid, look at the reaction at the top. For an acid, if the pH is higher than the, P, than the um, pKa, Notice the acid is on the right. If the pH is higher than the, the pKa, I've deprotonated that acid and it's become A minus. And so I have all these A minuses over here because I have a high, high pH. And then if I'm below my pKa, then I've got a I've got a protonated acid, and that's not ionized, that's neutral. So you have to think in terms of the atoms, ions, and molecules. You can't just think of pH and pKa. You've got to think, okay, the acid, when it's protonated, is neutral. And therefore, it's not ionized. Therefore, it's not soluble in the blood. When I deprotonate an acid, then it's an acid minus, an anion. And then it is ionized. So then it is soluble in the blood. So for bases, we flip this whole curve. So here... For bases, it's just one minus that percent ionization of the acid. And so for bases, when the pH is lower than the pKa, then I have the water solubility situation because it's pH plus. And then when the pH is higher than the pKa, I have a deprotonated base, which is neutral. That's not going to be water soluble. We're dealing with organic molecules, and so they're not going to be very soluble in water when they're neutral. But this is the thing that people mess up. And that's why um, it's better to do the ice table, but it's longer. You can only use this equation up here you know, if you know what you're doing. So just having the equation doesn't help you. It's, it's knowing the situation when they apply that, that's, that's important. So I hear a lot of writing. So go ahead and make sure you've distilled this information down and you've got your good notes. And if you need clarification, raise your hand. We'll do some board work and now I can show you when to use these things. Yes? So for the base, you would first find the percent ionization for the acid and then... Subtract from one. Yeah, and so that's, that's, what I would, that's why you only just have to worry about one equation. So you can do this. Remember the bases, a lot of times in the literature, they're listed with pKa's. Mm -hmm. And so you have the pH and the pKa, you can use this equation here. And then you can subtract from one to get the percent ionization of the base. Yeah. And so that's a fast way to do it. Like even those bases that we've done in uh, already in class, they were pKa's listed. So you can just use that equation and determine which side of the Ka you're on. And then if it's a base, the left side is ionized. If it's an acid, the right side is ionized. Yeah. So for the homework problems, it was percent ionization for acid and base. And I was like, I've seen the one for acid, but for base, I was like, Yeah. It. Does this help? Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, that a lot. All right, great, great. And so then here's the summary. So on the left, you have the acid column, and you can see the uh, different equations associated with it. And, and it's essentially what we just talked about, but you have the functional groups. Now, carboxylic acids are the most common, but occasionally you can have a, um, a hydroxyl that's beh behaving like an acid. You can deprotonate a hydroxyl. It's not, it's not a great acid, but 
you get the pH high enough, then it could come off and make an ionized substance. Um, and so you can see here this water solubility curve. You know, when the pH is higher than the pKa, then you have a soluble situation. But for a base, when the pH is lower than the pKa, then you have a soluble. Now, this is a weird situation, amphoteric. You have both kinds of functional groups. Think about amino acids. You have amino on one side, carboxylic acid on the other. So when are they soluble? Well, they're soluble in acid because the base is, the, it, the base is protonated, so the amine has an extra proton on it and it's positive. And then they're soluble at high pH where you've deprotonated the acid and the molecule's negative and it's soluble. Halfway between the two pKa's is that pI point, and that's the minimum of the solubility. So if you wanted that, uh, if you wanted that amino acid to go into the organic layer, you would put the pH right between the two, the pKa and the, and the pKa1 and pKa2, and that's that pI. So that would be a dip. That's the minimum solubility. So this is the water solubility curve. So it's soluble at really high base and soluble at acid, but in the middle between those two, you would have the pI, and that would be the minimum solubility. And here's some examples. So for this uh, benzoelectrogonine, it's a metabolite of cocaine, you know, if you were at a pH of 6, so right in between those two, that would be the minimum solubility. So if you wanted that to go into the organic layer, you could put the pH at 6, and then when uh, those molecules happen to swap protons, and you, you pull one off the base and put one on the acid, and it ends up in the organic layer, it can't come back because it's not ionized. So it's going to be all happy in the organic layer, and it's going to stay there. And so that's our point with all of this pH is partitioning. We want to separate things and separate one analyte from another. And so let's take a Kahoot on ice tables before we get into the partitioning techniques. Said, try the Kahoot app. <laughs> All right, One more. Yay, let it go before it drops out. So what is C base in this table? Dun, dun, dun. Hard to see the table. Oh. All right, very good. So the highlighted assumption. <clears throat> I can make the text big or the picture big. If you have any questions about any of the colors, I'll read them out to you. So read the yellow or read the blue. Your eyes are better than mine, though. <laughs> All right. So when C base divided by KB is greater than 100, or when C base is high. So, you know, extremely high, if you look at it, yeah, that's high enough.
of kb is 1 times 10 to the minus 1, or 0.1, would this assumption in yellow be valid? Uh-oh. So we have 2 divided by 0.1, that's 20, which is less than 100. So yeah, that would not be a valid assumption. It would give us some, some major error. How do I continue? Oh. There we go. What happens in the acidic stomach environment? <coughs> yeah, two, two possible answers. Acid groups are protonated and neutralized, meaning they're neutral, they're not charged. Our basic groups are protonated and ionized. Did anybody so here it says basic groups are deprotonated and ionized or and neutralized. This is an acidic environment, so you would not deprotonate something. Okay. And then this says uh, acid groups are deprotonated and ionized, and you wouldn't deprotonate something in an acidic environment. So Where are basic substances absorbed by the body? Okay. Well, basic substances are going to be protonated in the stomach. And so since they're protonated bases, they become charged. Because they're charged, they're ionized, charged and ionized, same thing and they go into the aqueous environment. So our bloodstream is the train system, and your ticket to get on the train is a charge. Okay? Or you're small enough that your polarity will let you be absorbed, you know, like something like a methanol or whatever. But for the most part, we're dealing with large molecules that come out of our food, and the only way they get into our bloodstream is to be charged. That's the ticket to the train, to go through the whole body. Um, that's why, you know, a lot of your um, long, large fibrous molecules are not absorbed, they pass through because one, they're, small, they're large, and two, uh, unless there's some sort of enzyme that can, can react with that substance in the stomach or in the intestines and create a charged species, it's not absorbed. And so if the chemistry of that substance isn't such that it can be made soluble in blood, then it's just going to pass through. Whoa, 100 points different there. Uh, 5,600. Yay, great job. <laughs> runners up. Now they're adding in runners up. Fourth and fifth place. All right, let's look at the partitioning techniques. So now that we know about pH and we can control it, let's look at the actual techniques that we use in lab. Different set of notes. And so these, uh, this is mainly focusing on liquid liquid extraction, but we also have all of the chromat chromatographic techniques. And so if you can get the, all the substances that you're interested in dissolved in some sort of matrix, then you can just go straight to chromatography. But a lot of times you want to do sample cleanup. And so liquid liquid extraction would be before chromatography. And so you may be separating your four or five analytes from all the other stuff and leaving all that junk behind. So, so this is where we would want to pay attention to some sort of extraction or digestion. Uh, maybe the sample matrix is a solid and it's, it's difficult to work with. Uh, this would be a situation for mineral substances. You would digest them in strong acid like an aqua regia, which is HCl and nitric acid mixed together. So it's really strong or piranha solution which is sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. That'll destroy just about anything. And that's why they call it piranha solution. <laughs> and so it will release the metal ions and all of the substances in that, uh, in that matrix 
that and now everything's dissolved, and then you can uh, you can use uh, you can analyze the solution. Uh, you can partition things by gas phase and liquid phase. And so if you have a volatile substance dissolved in a, in a solution, you can change the pH and drive some of those volatile substances out of the liquid. We did this very effectively with the biogas. At my last university was a huge agriculture school, kind of like what this school is for CJ. They are for agriculture. It was up in the Panhandle of Texas. And they did a lot of work with cattle and feedlots because they had a lot of concentrated feedlot uh, operations up there. And we wanted to take the, the waste from the cows and make, um, see if we could get biogas out of it. So recover some of the methane that's going into the atmosphere. If we could capture that and use it as an energy source, then that would keep it from going into the atmosphere, contributing to global warming. We'd actually get recover the energy that's still in that material. Even though it's waste, it's feces, it's still a lot of energy content in that, in that uh, substance. It's just not very pleasant. But we would take those liquid samples and as soon as we made it acidic, all of those fatty acid compounds would be protonated and now they're neutral. They really don't want to be in water. And they're small enough molecules that they come out the top. So it was dramatic. I mean, one or two drops of acetic acid into that solution would be enough for the smell to just go through the roof because that's where a lot of the smelly compounds are, those fatty acids. I mean, just, it was dramatic. And so your nose was the detector in that case. You put a drop of acid in that solution with the stir bar going, and all of a sudden it was like, wow, let's get this in the hood. So we learned right away, let's do this in the hood because we can't stand it. Uh, your nose is so attuned to that that they actually started um, buying, they bought a couple of them. These were gas chromatographs. And guess what the detector was? Students. And so they would train students on these olfactory standards. And so they would inject a standard that had four or five different smells in it. And the student had a mask on and it had a little knob of a dilutant gas. And so as soon as they smelled something, they turned the knob. And, and essentially the knob was always like uh, electronically going, turning down, right? And so it was always going to zero and the student would turn it up uh, as long as they could smell something and then when they couldn't smell it anymore, they let go, and the computer would turn the knob back to zero, the signal back to zero. And so you'd get a peak. When the student smelled something, they'd turn that knob, and that was your peak. And they quit turning the knob, and the computer would turn that knob back down. And so you would get a chromatograph, and the student's nose was the detector. And the reason we, had, we used students is because uh, we wanted a, many different people so that you would take the chromatographic trace with four or five students and you get an average signal for those and you could see that the smallest sometimes the largest stinky compound was a small concentration and sometimes a large concentration of compound would come through and the student didn't smell it and so when we're talking about uh, you know uh, human uh, you know environmental impacts the smells of these feedlots was dramatic I mean, it was terrible. And, and if you could attack the most concentrated substances, you might not have packed the smell. And so this would allow us to say, okay, how much of the smelly stuff is in this particular solution? And so it was a pretty amazing thing. It's called an olfactory detector. And so you have a trained panel of people and they would smell the stuff. And it didn't smell like what you would imagine poop smelling like, okay? It would just be a, a different smell. As soon as you smelled something, you would turn on the knob and start raising it up until you couldn't smell it anymore and then you let go. And it was pretty interesting. So again, but that's partitioning using gas phase. Um, we would drive those molecules out of the liquid phase into the gas phase and it's using Henry's law. So the solubility of that substance in water changes dramatically whether it's protonated or not. And so it had a high Henry's law constant, a very high effective vapor pressure when it was protonated and neutral. And so because it was neutral, it would come out of solution very readily. And then that could be injected into the GC. So is there like a waiver signing with that? Yeah, there's lots of kinds of waivers and, so and everything. Like, say like the injected carcinogen. Yeah, that or cyanide or something like that. I mean, it'd be, it would be terrible. Yeah. So there were lots of quality controls and, and things. We didn't use cyanide as a standard, you know. Okay, if you don't kill more than 3% of the students, then it's a <laughs> not, you know, null hypothesis. Is, <laughs> so, yeah, that wouldn't be good. 
So what we're, what we're talking about then is the liquid-liquid extraction. So this would be gas, you know, using gas phase. But let's talk about this partition between an organic and, a, and an aqueous phase. Uh, we've really discussed a lot about the things getting on into the aqueous phase. And so water and, and fat barriers, you know, those two different uh, distribution paths in our body is really important. And so fat solubility is just as important as water solubility. Um, it's going to protect... Uh, perhaps keep you from absorbing that substance. You know, if you take uh, morphine orally, only about half of it is absorbed into the body. So you have to give two times the dose if you're taking it orally. But if you inject it, then you're going right into the tissues, the, the muscle tissues and the fatty layers. Sometimes you put it into the skin with, and it goes right into the fatty tissues. And then a little bit of it is soluble in water, so it comes into the body slowly. And so it can, it can have like a little pocket or reservoir there. We're even seeing now with the patches, you know, the drugs will go into the fatty layer under the skin and then slowly go into the body. So uh, transdermal is important as well. And they need to know about the, the water solubility or the uh, fat solubility, lipophilicity. So this is the water octanol partition coefficient. So it's the concentration in the octanol layer and the concentration in the water layer. So we can put our substance in here and in this uh, separatory funnel, shake, 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 and then we can extract the water layer, put that on a GC or LC, and extract the octanol layer and put that on the GC or LC, and then we can look at how much of that substance is in each layer. And we take the ratio and that's the partition coefficient. And so then we talk about this different layers in contact with each other, and we can use that to separate substances. So let's look at this example. We propose a liquid-liquid extraction scheme, LLE, to separate a sample that contains naproxen, sodium, and codeine. And so step one is always to get more information. So where are some sources of information that you could get to know if you could separate these two substances? How would you know? So you're chemists. What are you going to go to? Where would you go to get information about these two molecules to know if you could separate them or not? Well, NIST would be a good one in terms of finding you know properties of molecules. Okay, so that's that's a good place to go. The Chem Chem Web book. Uh, what what are some other online resources? PubChem, and there you're going to have the publications, and you might be able to find them, but it's going to be pretty difficult because they're going to be buried in papers, and you may or may not have access to those journal articles. Okay, uh, they should put the relevant information into the abstract so that everybody can have it, but you may not. Okay, so PubChem's good to get the background information of how we got the information, but there's uh, like NIST more collects the information into a small space. PubChem will have the journal articles, but it's still a good resource. What are some others? Have you all used ChemSpider? It was, uh, so write that down, ChemSpider. <clears throat> it's an online resource that uh, eventually was either purchased or now is managed by the Royal uh, Society of Chemistry in, in the UK. So it has a lot of QSPR results on it. So it'll have the molecule and then some computer generated results. Uh, it also has some experimental results on it. No one said the CRC. Okay, that's been the resource for chemists going back, back to, you know, many, many years. This is my one from when I was an undergrad. We, uh, we had an award ceremony, and this was one of the awards that you got. I forget what I did to get it, but it was um, nice to get my own CRC. So I got this, like, my junior year. And this was the 95, 96 um, edition. That must have been grad school, actually. Yeah, I was in grad school. And then, uh, but if we're looking up naproxen or codeine, we're probably not going to find it in here. You know, this is more just organic molecules and, and inorganic substances, spectroscopic constants, and so on. So this isn't necessarily going to have the information we, we need. And maybe not even NIST. NIST would have thermochemical data, um, boiling points, melting points, enthalpy of fusion, and so on. But what do we need to find a separation? Solubility and pKa values. 
So those, it's good to have the Merck Index. So this is the Merck Index, Merck, the drug company, and we're dealing with drugs, right? And so this is, this is a table. This has all of the different substances in it. It's just one large table of information. And most, all of these are drugs. This is the Merck Index. And so this is a nice desk reference. Uh, you can find older copies. You know, you don't have to have the latest uh, for the stuff that we're dealing with. And so you can pick up an older copy. Just look for some online. Try to find a, a used copy of the Merck Index. It's a really handy resource. And so we can look up here, naproxen, right here. And this is some of, the, let me just read some of the stuff that you find in the Merck Index related to naproxen. And you've got the IUPAC name, uh, S6-methoxy-alpha-methyl-2-naphthalene acetic acid. <laughs> okay, so that, draw that out for me real quick, would you? <laughs> but that's why we call it naproxen. Okay, but that's just a trade name. There may be other trade names. In fact, let's look down here. The sodium salt, naproxen sodium, is also known as Aleve. Hey, I've heard of that, right? Anaprox, Apronax, Axer Alpha, Flanax, Ganestrol, Miranax, Primerol, Synflex. And so these are all the other names that you might hear. It's the same active ingredient, the same naproxen sodium. So that's pretty cool. You have all the other names that you might run across. It's got here LD50 information so the toxicological information that's the lethal dose where 50 percent of the population is expected to die so uh because mice are mammals that's some somewhat of a mimic for us so we could say it's about the same or similar toxicity in humans uh it's not that toxic actually uh, milligrams per kilogram so uh you know 435 milligrams per kilogram that's a pretty big dose and that's intravenous if orally uh, 1,234 milligrams per kilogram. So that's 1.2 grams per kilogram. So about a thousandth of the mice, mouse's body weight has to be ingested. You know, that's take your body weight and you know move the decimal place three times, and then that's how much you'd have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's not that toxic. So you could use the LD50 to give you an idea. And that's a 50-50 chance of dying. So you probably might even survive that. So, yeah. But, but the real information we want in here is the PKAs and, and the um, solubility. Okay. And so you can find that information here. And so that's summarized in this table that we have. And then here's the um, coding. And so you can find the entry for codeine, and it's, it's got all of its information. So here's our molecules. The naproxen sodium is an acid. The um, codeine is a base. And here's the information from the table in the Merck Index. Now, notice the solubility numbers. Water says insoluble. Ethanol, 1 to 25. Chloroform, 1 to 15. Ether, 1 to 40. Let me read out of here those numbers for the naproxen sodium. So it says here, solubility uh, for the naproxen sodium, it says, soluble in 25 parts ethanol. So do you see, that's what I read in the text. Look what I wrote. So it says, soluble in 25 parts ethanol. What is parts? I mean, it's just like gram to gram, right? So one gram and 25 grams of ethanol, okay? Or 20 parts methanol. So 1 to 20 in methanol, 15 parts chloroform, or 40 parts ether. So whether you're using mils or grams, but this is going to be a solid substance, and so there would be grams, so gram to gram. So that would be the solubility. Now let's go to the codeine and read its solubility numbers. This says 1 gram, so now it's telling you, 1 gram dissolves in 20 mils of water. Okay, so that's 1 to 20, because water is 1 gram per mil. Okay. Uh, it says 180 mils of alcohol. You know, the difference in mass or density between water and alcohol, is, you know, it's not the same. But you could just look at this as a shorthand and say, I just put in 180 under the ethanol. Okay, but it's not exactly 1 to 180. But you could just write those, it's again, 1 gram to 180 grams of ethanol if a gram of ethanol is one milliliter. 
you could do the conversion if you looked up the, the density of the, the ethanol. And so it says freely soluble in alcohol or ether. So it says no data here, but it says freely soluble. So it would be soluble in ether. So that's the information that you would get. Here's the pK A6.05. And let's see. No, nine point. Yeah. Oh, that's the monohydrate, sorry. Yeah, the pKa is 8.2. So, so that's what we have in the Merck index. And so you can see that that information might be difficult to find on PubMed because you'd have to dig through the articles. And you might have an article on the pKa, but you wouldn't have an article on the solubility. And so then you have to find different articles for the solubility. You might have the solubility of one of those, but not on the others. And so the Merck index has taken all of that literature and compiled it into a table. So it's really very good. One thing I didn't read, and I've already closed it, I wish I hadn't, but uh, it talks about the, the toxicity studies and it lists the actual articles. So the articles are listed in there too. And you can go pull the thread and actually see, and the patents for those are listed. So you can see the patents for the formulations. So there's a lot of information in there that you can pull about those different substances. So definitely you would want to get a Merck index. Okay. So a little commercial for that. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure there is, but it would be one of those that you got to pay for access to, and and so because they're gonna if you're if you're interested in the online version, that means you're probably working in the area and you want to have the latest updated, you know, copy. And so that's going to be probably much more expensive than getting one from five or six years ago or even ten years ago. So I would go for the old used one. Uh, you're not going to use it that often, and for the common substances they're going to be on there. But now something like the fentanyl analogs, you know, those may not be in there yet. And so those you might have to get in an online version. And so we're looking for solubility differences uh, in the organic phase. And so we're trying to pick the organic layer because we want water and, and some organic layer to be our two layer extraction. So we're trying to find the the biggest difference in the organic um, solubility. So we could have ether, we could have chloroform. Ethanol and water are miscible, so that's not going to be a good organic layer. So it would either be ether or chloroform. And so this has got a huge difference, so let's use that one. And so we would have our, our solution mixed up of our substances. And since the pKa's are very different, we have a pH of greater than 8.2 would move us to the right, where we've deprotonated the, the acid and we've protonated the base. So right here, this, um, this nitrogen is going to be protonate, or deprotonated. And so this is going to be neutral. We're going to deprotonate the acid and make it an anion. If we go down to lower pH, then we protonate that base, and now this is ionized, and we protonate the acid, and it's neutral. So when you're setting up this scheme, and I ask you which one's going to be in the organic layer, you don't know until you know the pH. Right? See, over here on the right, this one's neutral. It's going to be in the organic layer. Over on the left, the top one's neutral. It's going to be in the organic layer. So it's pH dependent. We can drive one or the other into the organic layer. And so when I say give us a, a, an extraction scheme, you don't only have to choose the organic layer, you also have to choose the pH that you're going to use to drive them apart. And we would want to stay out of the range in between. <laughs> okay? We want to push it to one extreme or the other so that we know where these are going to behave. And so we, we take the solution. Uh, actually, we, we can make our uh, two-layer um, scheme, the, the chloroform and the water, and mix both chemicals in there, and, and then we can adjust the pH of the aqueous layer. Notice that's the only layer we really have control of. We put in a, a bit of acid or some sort of phosphor, phosphoric acid buffer into the aqueous layer, and then or a few drops of acetic acid or a few drops of HCl, or make it basic by using sodium hydroxide, but we're dealing with the aqueous layer 
and that causes things to go in or out. So we can put it in here, we can shake it up, and we can look at the, um, you know, look at the difference. So here, if we're looking at the amount of naproxen sodium in the chloroform, we have some solubility here, uh, but in the naproxen in the water, uh, if it's neutral, it's going to be, so we're going to have infinite partition for the naproxen, and then the, for the, for the um, partition coefficient for chloroform versus water for the codeine HCl, you know, we have 1 in 800 over 1 in 20, and so it's about 0.25 in the chloroform layer. And so the codeine is going to go into the aqueous layer, and the naproxen is going to go into the organic layer. And so this is a, a way to draw this, I think, is useful. Let's take, um, let's make a table here, and let's call the proxen N and codeine C. And so we have this scale of pH. So 1 to 14. And we put our pKa's on here. So what are the pKa's for, if you look back in the notes, what was the pKa for naproxen? 4.2. 4.2. So we'll draw a line right here at 4.2. And then what was it for the codeine? It was 8? 8.2. And we'll draw a line here for the codeine. <clears throat> and this was a base, right? The codeine was a base. And so on this side, we have CH plus because it's acidic. It's the acidic side of the, of the pKa. And here we just have neutral C. And naproxen was an acid. So on the left, we have uh, NH. And on the right, we have N minus. And so if we've picked a, a pH of, of 9, then we would drive the codeine into the organic layer. But if we picked an acidic pH, we would drive the codeine into the aqueous layer. And so if we picked like a pH of 2, then our naproxen is protonated. It goes into the organic layer. So this would be organic, and this would be aqueous. Over here would be aqueous, and this would be organic. So this is my this is my favorite way to do these problems is to set up the pKa's, to set up the different rows for the substances, and notice we would want to avoid the pH in between these two pKa's because both of them are in the aqueous layer, and we want to separate these two. Now, if this was uh, if we wanted to clean up our sample, like if this was uh, some sort of mixture of naproxen and codeine in a, in a tablet that had a bunch of other junk in it, we grind it up, we could, we could put it into a, a pH 7 buffer and crush it up, and then both substances come into water, into the aqueous layer, and all the organic -y junk stays behind. And so that's a way to wash it and pull both analytes away from the organic stuff. Then we can put it in contact with chloroform and adjust the pH down and one would go into the organic phase. Or adjust the pH up and the other would go into the organic phase. But th that's me washing the sample away from the organic stuff. You find a place where they're both aqueous. You pull them both into solution. Then you put it in contact with another clean organic layer, adjust the pH and drive one out. And now you have the two analytes separated. And so this is a scheme where you can clean up and separate just about anything, just using liquid-liquid extraction. 
And so if you have your sample, you can adjust the, you put them both into the two phase, you know, set funnel, adjust the pH of the aqueous phase to under two and extract. And the organic layer will have all of the acid as neutrals. And then the aqueous layer will have all the bases and the water soluble substances. And so you take those layers and separate them and put them into two new separatory funnels and add the other phases. So we take the organic phase, put it into a new sub funnel and add in an aqueous phase that's clean and empty. Okay. And we adjust that pH to six and extract, you know, shake it. And now the organic layer contains the weak acids and the aqueous layer contains the strong acids. So pH of six is the separating point. And then we've really got all the strong acids in that aqueous layer, so we can set that aside. And then we can put the organic phase in contact with a new aqueous phase and adjust the pH to 10. So swing it way up to the basic side. And now the neutrals and uh, like in particular like this compound meprobromate, uh, a neutral compound that's not going to be pH dependent, has stayed in the organic phase the whole time. And so we've washed out all the water solubles and pH type compounds and we've left just the organics and neutrals. Going the other side, we take that aqueous layer, put it in contact with an organic, adjust the pH up to a basic level and drive the bases because we've uh, deprotonated them, drive the bases into the, or the weak bases into the organic phase and the aqueous um, has the, the uh, strong bases and metals and things like that. So this is a sort of a universal extraction scheme. It's going to use quite a bit of uh, organic solvent and, and water, but if we had sort of a generic unknown substance, set of substances and we wanted to classify it, look at all the different partitions we have. We have aqueous metals and water, water solubles, organics, strong bases, organic weak bases, and amphoterics like uh, amino acids and so on. We have strong acids and we have uh, weak acids, and then we have neutrals. So we've got all of these now six different beakers that contain a bunch of different types of compounds. And we can, we can look at them. Other separation techniques that you're familiar with, are gas chromatography for sure, liquid chromatography. When we get into the instrumental section, we'll pull some more information out of these. But, but basically, there's two, two vocabulary words that I want you to, to understand, and that is normal phase and reverse phase. It always helps to re revisit those because you, you see that all the time and if you don't know what they mean, then you'll be lost. So the normal phase chromatography, the first phases were aluminum oxide, the stationary phases, and so those were polar phases. And so it was normal to use aluminum oxide as our separation uh, stationary phase. And so that was a polar stationary phase. So normal phase means polar. That means that the polar molecules are going to come out slower. So if you've got a polar stationary phase, the polar molecules interact and they don't elute as fast as the nonpolar molecules. And reverse is the reverse of that. <laughs> but if you don't know what normal is, then you don't know what reverse means. Okay. So reverse a phase is a nonpolar stationary phase. Now we have polymers. So we'll have a long polymer inside as a stationary phase and it'll have a lot of benzene rings and things like a phenol silanes and so on. So silicon polymers that are really temperature, high temperature resistant, and then they'll have a lot of uh, aromatic groups. So very, uh, a very, you know, interactive stationary phase that, that will hold by, hold back nonpolar molecules and let the polar molecules elute first. And then you have uh, adsorption liquid chromatography where you just have a porous stationary phase. And so uh, molecules that uh, get tangled up in, in small pores will come out last. And so you can use this to separate um, polymers and larger molecules. Then you have ion exchange, which makes sense. Uh, you're dealing with ions and you're separating things by chelation. So you have a stationary phase that has uh, organic acid groups that will hold on to cations. And so you can separate cations by their binding affinities to these different acid groups. And then you can have amines that hold on to anions. So you can have a stationary phase that has a lot of ammonium groups, and then the, the um, anions will stick to that stationary phase and be separated. So here's thin layer chromatography and also column chromatography. And if you haven't 
have y'all done this? Did you do this in organic or quant? I mean, put a little drop down here at the bottom. And if you have an elutin tank, so you put the drop here uh, at the bottom, and then you stick it in this tank, and the uh, solvent front moves up, and you start to see your little dots separate, and then eventually you draw a mark where the solvent is, and you let it dry. If you don't draw that mark, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, so the solvent front moves forward, and you can see the wetness on the aluminum oxide, and you pull it out with a pencil, you make a mark, and then you set it out to dry. And sometimes you can't see your spots because they're white and aluminum oxide is white, but you shine a little UV light on there, and they might fluoresce, or they might darken the aluminum oxide. You can spray this with a developer solution, and you get color changes. So if your molecules will you know, there's spot tests that you can use and spray. And this is how you can get the different compounds in, uh, in THC. You can get the different cannabinoids by spraying a developer on there and they'll make different colors. So you can see, you can do a thin layer chromatography on an ether extract from marijuana and you can put a drop on there and separate it. And this is gonna be very important for the different vaping oils too. Um, because if you wanted to see if it was just CBD oil or if it had the other kinds of cannabinoids that are psychoactive, and you could tell with this technique very quickly. So, uh, if you wanted to separate large amounts, this is a tiny amount. These are micrograms on these spots, maybe even less than that. Uh, if you wanted to separate a large amount, then you have column chromatography. And some of you in biochemistry are using you know, prep columns to separate your analytes before you uh, move on to the next step. This has been revolutionary. And this is the enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay or a LISA test, where they've taken substrates and antibodies and, and uh, enzymes to link these things to, uh, what's that, to the different trays. Y'all seen this? Yeah. Where do you see it? In, oh, in molecular, okay. So tell me your experiences in it. What did y'all use it for? It didn't work. It didn't work? Oh, that's too bad, because it's such a great technique. What do you think went wrong with it? Uh, the plant doesn't process. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are we all using it to test? Um, everything. Uh, we're trying to sequence a mandragora. Oh, the plant in Harry Potter where you pull out the pot and it stinks. Oh, the mandrakes, yeah. yeah. It didn't work. It didn't work, okay. Robin got the closest thing to but. So you had to extract something, right? What did you extract from the plant? Like you grind it up and homogenize it, or what? Yeah. Yeah, that was an earlier one. Yeah, that was the other part of the DNA of who killed what's his name. Well, there are a lot of other examples that are a little bit more guaranteed to work with these. Those sound like pretty tricky examples. Um, but, you know, DNA and those kinds of things are large proteins. But this, this is really good at detecting small molecules like hormones. Okay? And so you can have uh, this little scheme here. You can have the, you know, an antibody or, or an enzyme. Uh, you get this enzyme that has uh, the molecule that you're interested in, and this uh, uh, this antibody that is that is sensitive to it that has a docking port for it or a pocket, and then you can have the drug. And so the drug can replace this enzyme. Uh, drug piece that you have in the in the assay and you can see a color change a lot of times that when this is free in solution it can can metabolize this substrate and create a color or to make a color go away and so if you don't have any drugs from your test sample then these little enzyme drug complexes stay linked to the antibody and they don't cause a color change but if you put, if you have the substance that you're looking for, you know, from your sample, it will displace these and then you get a strong color change. And so you have these plates, and I mean, some of these go up to 15, you know, 1,500 wells, and you can look at the different color changes. Um, there's a little, oh, didn't mean that. Let's go back to the end here. You don't have to have an instrument to do this, okay? Here's, a, here's the exact same setup 
And, and do you know what that is? Pregnancy. Yeah, it's a pregnancy test. But they also have them for like ketone strips, all of your little color change strips. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them work on this same kind of uh, principle. And so you can put these, these little antibody and enzyme substrates on paper. So you can have a little paper down here and then your sample, and in a case like a urine test, your sample will flush along and if your, if your molecule of interest triggers that color change, then, then you, you've identified that molecule. And if that molecule is a hormone associated with pregnancy, then you have a positive test. Now, how do you know the test is working well? Well, you need to put a pattern on there that says, okay, if, if any urine touches the sample, then I need to trigger a color change here if the sample is working correctly and if the, if the sample strip hasn't been destroyed by heat or whatever. But then if the hormone is present, they have a pattern there for the hormone. <clears throat> and so the negative sign is actually saying the test worked. The enzymes are good, the antibodies are good, all of the things in that test are good. Uh, and so the test should work. But if the hormones are present, then you get a pattern here and you see a plus sign. And so that's pretty interesting, I think. So the quality control is the negative. If you don't see the negative, then the test was, was messed up in some way. But if you see the negative and you don't see the positive, you say, well, I'm sure the test worked because the negative was there. But I don't see the positive, so the hormone wasn't present. in sufficient concentration to cause a color change. So I think that's pretty neat. The same kind of uh, enzyme-linked deal can be used for these tests. Yes? So is that maybe why, with like, with pregnancy tests, they always do the annoying thing of like one line means that uh, one line means negative, two uh, two lines means positive, but they never like make it where there's just a plus sign or something like that. Oh, the fact that if you overlap those two things. Then you have well, like, this was just one example. Okay. You know, they may, may have changed or different different groups. So, you know. Okay, so if you have it overlapping, then they might. Have it. Uh, yeah. So it may it may be yeah it may be that they want to keep them separate, but but yeah. You know, I've seen examples where it was a plus to tell you that it's a positive. Yeah, we're a little bit over time.